Well, we're here at the beautiful Isaac Walton Lodge, playing a little shuffleboard. Ha ha! I used to drink a bunch of Ole back in my beer drinking days. You should your This is a historic railroad lodge. When I was a young man here at the Isaac Walton Lodge, I was probably about 16 when I entered a cross country ski race here. And uh, there was a great big guy from Australia in the race, and I decided I'd go right behind him. So I, I was a good racer, I often won, and I, so I went right behind him. The whole race is about 10 kilometers, and then on the last 100 yards I said track, and he had to get out of the track, and he did his best to keep up with me, but I was too fast, I zoomed around him, and I won a very nice Rossignol ski bag that I still keep my skis in to this day. And after the track, he said, man, young man, you're fast. You could be doing some great racing, but you're just on those old wooden skis. I tell you what, I own a ski shop in Australia and I'm gonna give you my ski. So he gave me these very nice, they were called Kongsberg racing skis that I enjoyed winning some other races on. I was a raft guide for a couple of seasons with Great Northern Whitewater. And on a spring training trip in May, when it was snowing, three of our boats came through. Now the boat I was in with Dan paddling, it went through this rapid. This rapid is called Brown's Hole. And when it's high to medium high, it's very treacherous. So after we went through, our boss, Reno Baldwin went through and it caught him in a side eddy in here. And he just kept going round and around for several minutes. And we were down here on the other side and we had, you know, just pulled over to make sure the rest of them got through it safe. But there was really nothing we could do. It was snowing, it was cold, the river was ice freezing, and Reno was just going around and around in here. And so finally they began to cast the five gallon buckets out into the stream and, and allow the pole to, to help pull them out. And they did it several times without success. And then he broke his oar. And then he's really having a hard time going round and round and it was kind of a kind of a life and death situation really. But finally they, they kept casting the five gallon bailing bucket out and the, the current finally grabbed them strong enough to pop them out of that very strong back current. I'm seating in the car. Lester opens the window whenever he wants, he just opens it oh, again. Man, <laughs> Just when he needs a little fresh air, he knows how to step on that deal and he opens it right up. Well, today Mary and I and Lester are doing the Stanton Lake Grant Ridge Trail. You know, when I was a young man, we did this in the middle of winter on snowshoes. And if I remember right, it's about three and a half miles, uh, very uphill at first. But when there's not much hiking in Glacier because it's open in such a limited way, this is a nice trail to come hiking near the Stanton Lake Lodge on US Highway 2. Now we went up there in the middle of in the dead of winter and there was probably three and a half feet of snow on the ground. I went with Joe Purdy, Gerard Bird, and I believe my good friend Jimmy Grant, Grant Ridge. And Gerard decided to make a snow cave for us. So he was in there with his little portable shovel making a snow cave and then all of a sudden it collapsed on him. And man, we went with our shovels and digging in any way we could to get him out of there. And by the time we got him out of there, he said, thank God, it was like concrete. I couldn't breathe. I would have been dead in another 40 seconds, I think. So then what we did where it had collapsed is we just burrowed in, uh, shoveling it all out. And then we had about a four foot wall on the side and we put some lodge poles across, put some visqueen on there and put about that much snow on top. And I remember that's the best I've ever slept in my life in that snow cave. It was nice and toasty, about 30 degrees, and we were all having a good time. Well, I'm sure gonna remember this spot. That's gonna be some beautiful wild strawberries here in about a month. And here's what the huckleberries look like in mid-June in the high country. It's called Indian paintbrush. And that's another beautiful plant we have up here in the high country. Called yew wood. The Indians would make their bow and arrows out of this. Now we are entering the Great Bear Wilderness. The wonderful thing about Hungry Horse is it's surrounded by wilderness. 
Glacier Park, the Great Bear Wilderness, the Bob Marshall Wilderness. It's pretty awesome. Well, we just passed a party that said they had caught some fish up there. Uh, not real big, but they had done it. It's my beloved wife, Mary. She actually requested to uh, go on this hiking trip. She says, I can do anything because I walked three miles to Bullman's Pizza. <laughs> Mary and I went on a 14 mile trip yeah. last summer. And yeah, Grinnell Glacier, that's where we went. Glacier. Mary was just sprinting back practically because she wanted to, catch the boat. wanted to catch the boat, which would save us two and a half miles. And just as we were running out into the clearing where we could see the boat, it was motoring off under its diesel. This is a very nice trail. You can really stretch your legs out and get some exercise on this baby. And there's our mountain dog, Lester. Well, we already made it here to Stanton Lake. You can pretty much see it up there. Rather than going on up there, I believe we'll do a little extra hiking up Grant Ridge. Yeah, well, now here we are in Grant Ridge Trail. This is pretty awesome. We just got really rained on, but it's uh, so it's not good, so we're having a good hike. Mary didn't like this part of the trail right here. I did get my shoes wet. Well, Lester. So, Les, what do you think? Should we turn back or go forward? Boy, there's plenty of mosquitoes right here, baby. Here comes the beautiful Mary Jane Torreon Willows. And this one here is called the Thimbleberry. It will have a thimble-shaped berry, like a raspberry, and they are quite good eating. Okay, right about there, mm -hmm. Lester and Mary. Well, good morning, everybody. This morning we are looking at the book of Colossians, chapter 2, and we'll have Brother Jawel read 1 through 8. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Colossians, chapter 2. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Odysseus, as for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches, of the full assurance of understanding, to acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should be guilty you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the, the world, and not after Christ. King James Version in verse 3 starts out, In Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In his letter to the Colossian church, Paul was trying to head off the effects of a cult teaching called Gnosticism, which is based on the Greek word nosos, which means to know. The basic message of the cult was, yeah, Jesus and Christianity is all well and good, but if you really want to know the deep spiritual truth, you must get involved with us because we alone have the secret knowledge that will lead you to complete enlightenment. This, by the way, is a very similar line that many of the cults in our day and time use. 
Most of them don't really spend time trying to discredit Christ and Christianity. They just say, well, if you really want to know the truth, then you've got to join in with us. Or you need Charles Taze Russell's uh, all new and improved Bible studies to show you the truth. Or you need the Book of Mormon to go along with your Bible to tell you what it really means. So here is this one simple verse of scripture and in it Paul dismantles their premise by saying, no, you don't need the secret cult teachings to bring you to the fullness. What you need is Jesus Christ. He is the fullness of God. In him, all the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. And when you get to know him, when you get rooted and grounded in him, all that you need to know will come pouring into your soul. Can I get an amen? Amen. Not Jesus and your secret patent and formula. Not Jesus and your all new study guide. Paul declares all the secrets, all the special hidden insights you might ever need to know. It's all hidden in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He goes on in verse four in the amplified version saying this. I say this so that no man should deceive you with fine sounding arguments. The Gnostics obviously had some good apologists who could argue intelligently for a system of knowledge that would take anyone who listened away from the simplicity of knowing Jesus Christ. The Gnostics would argue intelligently to take people away from that simple faith of Jesus come into my life, be my Lord, be my King, like we were singing this morning. You're the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And they would, in doing so, get people away from holding on to the giver and source of all knowledge. Many university systems of thought are there that lead us away from the wisdom of Jesus and the truth revealed in God's word. Our whole country fell in many ways for a system of thought that led away from Jesus. And that system of thought is materialism which is basically the accumulation of things to try to meet an inner spiritual need. You and I have a hole in our heart that only Jesus Christ can fill. You know Jesus and you know peace. On the other hand, when you don't know Jesus, you don't know peace. And to try to fill that hole with accumulation of things, nice car, nice boat, get a motorcycle, got the payment on the house and everything all in order. And yet somehow there's that gnawing inner sense of a lack of peace because God never created materialism to fill that void that only Jesus Christ himself can fill. Can I get amen? Amen. Now, once we do know him, we begin to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. But that's a whole different thing than trying to satisfy a spiritual thirst by buying material things. Many in our country sold out to that philosophy. And then when Babylon came crashing down here recently, they also came crashing down. They also came crashing down. But we who are keyed into the new Jerusalem and our treasures are laid up in that city whose streets of gold We just came cruising along like we always were because we were tied into a different economy. We were tied into a different source of satisfaction. Hallelujah. That Jesus alone can bring. Those who seek the true source of wisdom and knowledge get a hold of Jesus Christ and begin seeking him. They get their soul satisfied like it speaks of in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 and 2. Ho, you that thirsteth, come to the waters. You that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your labor on that which does not satisfy? 
Listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight as in the richest of fare. Hallelujah. That's the goodness of God who brings our soul delighting in the richest of fare. Hallelujah. So Paul establishes that the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. Isn't it something as we stand here at Huckleberry Land, we see all these people coming by thinking if they could just get a milkshake, if they could only buy a piece of pie, they will be happy. But they see the sign, church is a welcome, come on to church, but nobody is coming in. Because the average person, they want the huckleberry pie or the huckleberry pancake. <laughs> they don't want the spiritual truth that really satisfies. Yeah, but we're wise people. We're seeking first the kingdom of God, and then all other things will be added unto you. Somebody would say, James, you're the richest person we know. And you say that materialism doesn't satisfy? Yes, that's what I say. I've sought God. I've given generously into his kingdom. I've given multiple cars away to other people in my lifetime. And now people, are, some people say, how come you have seven cars? <laughs> it's because you give to God. He'll give you back a multiplied version. Hallelujah. But I don't seek those things. I don't, I'm not calculating how I can make enough money to get another car. It just kind of came to be like, uh, and even this beautiful river property that Mary and I have, I wasn't looking around. I didn't have seven realtors. All right, look for a river property. I want a, a place with a great view and this and that. I was just caring for the church, just going down to visit one of the sisters, making sure they were okay. And afterwards, I looked over there and I thought, oh my gosh, can that piece that has a realty sign on it actually be for sale? I climbed over the fence, went down there, and was amazed by the beautiful, beautiful view. And it wasn't a labor. It wasn't like I had to mortgage even my wife's fingernails to, to get it. I just I was able to get a loan and God bless the business. And the next thing you know, we had that beautiful piece of property. That's the way life is designed to be. Live. Put God first. Put Jesus Christ first. Put the church first. Put the word of God first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these other things, they come to you just in a natural fashion. Hallelujah. So the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in Jesus Christ. But when you get close to Jesus, he will anoint your mind so that the wisdom and knowledge for any given field will come to you. But you may have to dig for it. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. In other words, God has hidden certain aspects of wisdom and knowledge. He has not hidden them from us, but he has hidden them for us. We have to dig, we have to seek, we have to press into his presence, and these things come to us. In the height of the World War I, I believe it was, the uh, Germans had a strategy called Blitzkrieg, where their tanks were faster than any of the tanks of the surrounding nations. So they would just line up an armada of their tanks and blitz a country. And before that country knew what was happening, Poland will fall or, or the beginnings of the USSR would fall. It's very interesting though what, what the Russians did. The Russians have such a vast expanse of land that they defeated them by putting into effect a policy called the scorched earth policy. They would burn every village, burn every uh, bunch of wheat, burn every supply and run ahead of the tanks. So when the Germans got there, they would find nothing to eat, nothing to sustain themselves. And by doing so, they actually outwitted the Germans who eventually kind of froze to death with no food. Anyway, enough history lesson. In that critical hour, however, the U.S. government called upon an engineer named R.J. Letourneau, who was famous for his creativity. And they said, 
we got to have you develop a tank that is at least as fast as the German tanks because we're losing this war. What he would do to get his ideas is he would go to church and he would worship God. I don't know if you felt it this morning, but when we were worshiping God, I felt an enlivening presence. I used to enjoy all manner of different drugs, trying to seek that perfect high. And yet that enlivening presence of God is what I was really after all the time. And when Laterno would get in that enlivening presence of God, the ideas of how to do a thing in engineering would come to him. And that's how he got the idea to make the faster tank than the German tanks. God has hidden knowledge, not from us, but for us, hoping that we would be like a king who would search out the wonderful hidden truths God has laid up for us. In Psalm 119, David declares, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things in thy law. There's things in there that are wonderful. Now the Amplified, let's get go back to Colossians. If you're following along, we're in Colossians chapter 2. This is a little thing that will help you find Colossians. And what it is, is go eat popcorn. G is go, that's Galatians. Eat is E, that's Ephesians. P, pop, is Philippians. Corn, that's Colossians. If you can remember, go eat popcorn, you, you can always get around well in these scriptures. So Colossians, go eat popcorn, would be the last of the four uh, famous epistles. Chapter 2, in verse 5, the Amplified says this, leaning the entire human personality on him in absolute trust and confidence in his power, his wisdom, and his goodness. To me, faith comes when someone in my life has proved trustworthy. Now, I'm wondering if I can get a volunteer to fall back into my arms. Does anyone want to fall back into my arms today? Mary. Mary. <laughs> Mary, you come and be my volunteer. You're the natural one. Come, I need you to come and stand right here, and you'll fall back, and I will catch you. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure I will catch you. Just stand right here. Thank you, my love. This is my beautiful wife, Mary. Okay, now I need you to just fall backwards. Okay. Go ahead. Good. See, I'm right there to catch you. Amen. Let's get Mary. Good job. So the verse says the leaning of the entire human personality on him in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. We as a people were dedicated to this, and it's even on our money. In God we trust. The Bible says trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And don't lean on your own witty understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. There's not that many people that I truly trust with my back and with my personal items and my belongings. That I don't, don't just trust anybody just because I say that they're a preacher or something. It takes a, a, a bit of time to, for somebody to prove trustworthy. I think Joel was, <laughs> he was telling me, I don't think I can trust anybody. Every person in my life has ended up letting me down and backstabbing me. Well, I'm trying to be a trustworthy person in Joel's life. And I've found him to be a trustworthy person in my life. And he's a guy that I'm beginning to place quite a bit of trust in. Mary, I trust her an awful lot. She's always been there for me, even when I've been foolish. She been standing right there with me. Amen. I have a lot of trust in that woman. And uh, even on the refrigerator, she, she wrote, always know that I will be here for you, to love you, to support you, to care for you. And that means a lot to me. That's a beautiful thing for a wife to write. And I, I would like us all in this room 
to be able to trust each other, that we can trust each other, that we can fall back in each other's arms, that we got your back. Most of the people that have ever told me, man, I got your back. As soon as something really bad happened, they weren't nowhere to be seen. <laughs> but we need to be become the type of people that we got each other's back. Amen. But Jesus is that kind of person. There is in Yellowstone Park a geyser called Old Faithful. And it's called Old Faithful because precisely at the same time, every day for the last 2,500 years, it has erupted at that same time. You can almost set your watch by it because it is faithful. And Jesus, my friends, is faithful. He is the brother, the friend that sticketh closer than the brother. He is the one and true God. In the book of Revelation, John saw one seated on a white horse whose name was faithful and true. Faithful to show up, always on time, old faithful. Jesus is the one. He's faithful and true, and his very name is engraved on his armor, faithful and true. That's his character. He's faithful and true to you. You can lean your entire personality on him in absolute trust and confidence in his wisdom, power, and goodness. The Bible says no man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. And I wondered to myself, well, why did I make it 38, 40 years or whatever it is now? And a lot of my friends just made it a few months or a few few years at the most and you don't see them in church you don't see them reading their bible you don't see them in the way of the lord anymore well it's partly this the bible says no man can say jesus is lord except by the spirit of god now if i was to go into the south fork saloon and martin city and had a hundred dollar bill and i said hey i'll give this to anybody in here who will say jesus is lord I bet I could find some guys that I'll oh, say Jesus is Lord like this. Jesus is Lord. And so the verse is not saying that you can't physically articulate the words. The verse is saying you cannot lean the entire human personality on him and ask absolute trust, confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, except by the Spirit of God. That is saying Jesus is Lord. That is when we say, Lord, I'm no longer on the throne of my life. I give you control. I declare that you are my Lord. You're my king. You're bringing good things into my life. In God I trust. Hallelujah. And you get in that sense. And that is truly saying Jesus and Lord. Now, when I came to know Jesus Christ, I had a rap song that I, I, I sing and and it's really very true. For 17 years, I never said a prayer. I was a slave, but I wasn't aware. But then a civil war started down in my soul. It was a bitter battle, but I gave him control. Because Lord means boss, and Lord means king. A new life to live, new song to sing. So take a step forward. Be really brave. Take him as Lord, and you will be saved. Hallelujah. See, that's the true salvation, is when you say, Jesus is my Lord. And when I said that, I was ready to give up the party and, and the girls and the daily pot and everything and really put myself in his hands. All right, now we will get into verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, Strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So there's a lot in that verse. First, it says receive, receive Jesus Christ. Second, it says continue to live in him. The King James says walk ye in Jesus Christ. And the third says rooted and the fourth is built up. If you're taking notes, you might want to take those notes. Receive, continue to live, be rooted, and be built up. Another version says established or strengthened. So the first portion is 
to receive him. This is the one who does not walk in step with the weak, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who, and who meditates in his law day and night. Good morning, welcome. So, a lot of times when we first come to Christ, there's an adjustment of our friendships that needs to take place. I don't know about you, but I had some pretty tight friendships that I had to, to come into a, a new thing when I became a Christian. I had to make some new buddies because the ones that I was having, we had a lot of fun, but all that fun was killing me. So I had to make some new changes. And so first it says, receive Jesus Christ. We receive Christ in our heart by opening the door and receiving him in. Second, it says, continue to live in him. The King James Version says, walk ye in him. The first step is to receive the seed of the word of God. I'm going to read for you Matthew 13, verse 3 to 9. Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower. And I will read verse 3 to 9. Then he told many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. First of all, we receive Christ. We receive the word that somebody spoke to us to receive him into our heart. Then we got to guard that seed. And it says, continue to live in him, rooted and grounded in him receiving jesus is just a start i was born again in this young people's revival but i was one of the few that went two years three years and now 40 years because i did, could decided to continue in him i decided this wasn't just a phase i was going through everybody said when i first came in ah oh, it's just a phase but he's going through a phase but it wasn't just a phase because i determined that I used to be a cross-country ski racer. I raced up to 50 kilometers, that's 33 miles. And I knew what it was to train for a race, to engage a race, and to finish a race. And so I decided, I'm not just starting this Christian thing, I'm finishing this Christian thing. I'm gonna finish the race, and I'm not gonna hear when I'm done, the Lord say, well, you're done. I'm gonna hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And so I was determining to continue. So first you receive, then you continue, and third, you get rooted. Once I had the 10 acres, I think Joelle has seen in the house there, and I decided I wanted a row of trees along one border. So I took little fir trees from all over my property, and I planted them along that border. Some made it, and some didn't. Now, the ones that made it, they had to get rooted in the new environment. They had to not freak out that they were in a new environment, but they had to adjust to it. They had to let their roots go beyond the boundaries of their former environment and into that new soil and get deep in that new soil and begin to draw their sustenance from that new soil. When you and I become Christians, we are used to gaining our sustenance, our sustenance. When you and I become Christians, you and I are used to gaining our sustenance and our nutrition from the things of this life, from the things of this world, from the, the shows that we liked on TV, from the the MTV or the people that we hung with or whatever. And there's an adjustment that takes place where all of a sudden 
we're getting our sustenance from the word of God. All of a sudden we're gaining from our gleaning from our Christian friendships rather than the people we used to hoot and holler with. And there's an adjustment if we're going to go forward. But the Bible says get rooted, get into the word of God, get into the new things in your world in a strong and consistent way. And like Mary read, then you will be like a tree planted by the water of God's word, rooted and grounded and bearing fruit. Now I'll read for you Psalm 92, 12 to 15. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit, even in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. So when you get established in the word of God and the truths of scripture, you are becoming like a, like the Bible says, a cedar of Lebanon, strong and flourishing, planted in the house. Some people say, well, I got a relationship with God. I know God, I get God out in the mountains. Well, I do too, but we also need to come into the house of God, be planted in the church and get that nourishing effect of the word preached to us in a balanced way. And then we will grow strong, nourished and powerful. Amen. Number four, it says built up, strengthened, established. This is what happens after you have continued in the faith and become rooted in Christ. Since your roots are connected to the life-giving sap of the word of God, since you've been planted in God's house where, where you will flourish, you will become built up, strengthened, and established. That sounds more than just getting by. That sounds more like you are becoming a force to contend with. When I used to get into fights at parties, I usually tried to avoid those muscle-bound types that looked like they could probably knock my block off because of their daily sessions of pumping iron at the wave. The built up strengthened type were not the usually the ones people picked on for fights. Well, that's God's ultimate intention for you and I, that we become built up. I'll read a couple of scriptures here for you. First Peter two, verse two. Desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you might become built up, strong, and nourished. Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are so slow to learn. In fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers, but instead you need somebody to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use, everybody say constant use, constant use. That's how you're gonna be rooted and grounded. Constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So that is being built up. In the days of the Bible, the apostle or the church planter, he didn't stay there nourishing people and feeding them Gerber baby food for three months. He'd go into the community, he'd preach the gospel, he'd see the people come to Christ, he'd teach them in a daily way for a couple of months, he would ordain elders, and then he'd take off. And he said, all right, you guys are good to go. Change your world, take your city. And the people were expected to become mature, built up, strong individuals in Christ that could lead others to Christ, that would disciple their families, and that would turn their world around. All they really got from the pastor was a letter every once in a while, giving them some encouragement. And so friends, what we've created in America today is in some ways more of a spiritual nursery where the people are expected to come and sit down and put in their money and that's about all they do. But the Bible says the pastor, the apostle, the prophet, they're to equip the saints for the works of the service. That you're not always supposed to be just a baby sitting there. You're supposed to get strong in Christ. Put the money in the 
Like a slot machine. Yeah, put the money and sit there like a shop machine. No, you're to become a disciple of Christ that is discipling other people. Hallelujah. You become a force for God. If you will go through the first four steps, the result, according to our text, will be that you'll be built up. I was talking to a friend I have that played in the NFL. His poster's over there. He, wrote on it for my son Abe who was a great football player too and his name was Gordon Banks and he played for uh, several teams including the Saints and the Cowboys and because my son was a football player who ended up playing college football I asked him you know I'm kind of concerned for my son it's a lot of talent but there's plenty of injuries in football what do you have to say to me as somebody who used to play professional he says well, first of all, as believers, you have the hand of God with you. I remember returning a punt for, for the Cowboys against Cincinnati, and these guys were barreling down on me, and I don't even know how, but with God's help, I shook to the side and I ditched them all. And that's the hand of God. You have the hand of God even in a football setting, he said. And that was so powerful. And then he said, conditioning. He said, many injuries take place when the other guy is more conditioned than you are. Get in top condition and that will reduce your risk of injury. He said, when I played, I was only 5'10", 180 pounds at the max, but I had a 40-yard a, a sprint of 4.2 and I could bench over 400 pounds, even as a little guy. So it helped me stay injury free. He said, you don't hear of Jerry Rice getting injured very much, do you? And I said, no, I don't think I've ever heard of Jerry Rice getting injured. He says, that's because he's conditioned better than any of us. He gets up and he runs up these mountains every single day. And, he, and that's the way I'm talking about in Christ, my friends. We get built up in Christ. Mary and I were there pumping iron. I still play baseball and I got to be in shape. And so I was doing my stuff last night. I'm getting built up physically, which is important, but getting built up spiritually in the word of God is equally important. That's why Paul said, be built up in Christ. And then the text says that the result of these first steps will be that you begin a win, become a winner in life. You begin to win a few. You begin to go through some things that used to take you down and be your sabotage point. But now you're just going right on through it with a resiliency that you never had before because you're planted on the rock, hallelujah. My business went through this COVID with a success that few others have expected because we were planted on the rock. We weren't keyed into, oh, you better be scared. Oh, you're going to go down. Oh, you better just close things up. We just kept on plugging because we figured I put that thing on my front. No fear here. This is a heaven blessed, bleach sanitized place. And we went right through it. And now we're reaping a great reward because we got ready in those tough times. So we get built up. The Amplify says, walk it out. Regulate your lives and conduct in union with and conformity to him. A woman could be married to a godly Christian man, but she has a choice whether she will regulate her life and conduct in union with that marriage in conformity to her husband's desires for her, in conformity to her marriage covenant or she could go on the internet and find a lover on the side. Or she could start gambling and get sucked into some money wasting habits. Or start being addicted to R rated dramas and not even wash the dishes for her husband. Just because she is married to a good clean man is no guarantee that she will live in a good clean way. She can choose to regulate her life and conduct in a way that is in union with her husband in conformity to his desires for her. Even though the husband is a good guy, he cannot force her to behave. God will not force you to make the right choices in your life, but the Holy Spirit will come alongside to help you make those choices. 
With the Holy Spirit's help, we have the same choice to walk it out, regulate our life and conduct in union with and conformity to him. Hallelujah. Joel came into his household and found her, his wife sitting on there, the sofa with another man, and it kind of blew up his world. She was not regulating her life and conduct in conformity to his wills. But the Bible says here that we are to regulate our lives and conducts in union and conformity with Christ. Hallelujah. Now, verse 8, it says, Beware lest you be taken captive through deceptive philosophy and intellectualism. The Christians Paul was addressing were in very real danger of being wrangled in by deceptive philosophy and intellectual argument. In this case, it was Gnosticism. But in our day and age, there's other types of isms that would like to draw us in. Anybody heard of the Essene Gospel of Peace? Or of Yogananda? or of the New Age teachings, Maresh, can't remember his last name. You were once in church, but now you're reading that stuff instead of reading your Bible. You were once excited about God's word, but now you're excited about the crystals and that philosophies, the isms. Communism is a philosophy. Take all the wealth and divide it up. Everybody works for the good of the whole. Darwinism is a ism. Evolution took me for a ride for 17 years. The kids would talk about God or Jesus, and I would say, you ignoramuses, don't you realize you evolved from Australopithecus? And I had it all down, man. I knew the steps and everything. But for our last, our last scripture today, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since... In the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him. But God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So it was foolishness to the college professors of their day. And it is sometimes to our day as well. And yet in Christ is all the fullness of the wisdom and the blessing of God. Let's pray. Father, let us do what this word says. Receive Christ. If you have not received Christ, pray. Heavenly Father, I open up my heart to you. Jesus, come into my life and make all things new. Then you live in conformity with his will and desires, adjusting your life to what he's asking of you. And then you become rooted and built up you become buff in the spirit and knock over some of those things that used to knock you over. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, and I think it's time to open it. <laughs>